a reading from the letter of St. Paul to Titus. Beloved, you must say what is consistent with sound doctrine, namely, that older men should be temperate, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, love, and endurance. Similarly, older women should be reverent in their behavior, not slanderers, not addicted to drink, teaching what is good so that they may train younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, chaste, good homemakers under the control of their husbands so that the word of God may not be discredited. Urge the younger men similarly to control themselves, showing yourself as a model of good deeds in every respect with integrity in your teaching, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be criticized, so that the opponent will be put to shame without anything bad to say about us. For the grace of God has appeared, saving all and training us to reject godless ways and worldly desires, and to live temperately, justly, and devoutly in this age, as we await the blessed hope, the appearance of the glory of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to deliver us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people as his own, eager to do what is good. The word of the Lord. The salvation of the just comes from the Lord. Trust in the Lord and do good that you may dwell in the land and be fed in security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will grant you your heart's requests. The, the, Lord. the Lord watches over the lives of the wholehearted. Their inheritance lasts forever. By the Lord are the steps of a man made firm, and he approves his way. The the Turn from evil and do good that you may abide forever. The just shall possess the land and dwell in it forever. Sancti Evangelii secundum lucam. Gloria Jesus said to the apostles, Who among you would say to your servant, who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here immediately and take your place at table? Would he not rather say to him, prepare something for me to eat? Put on your apron and wait on me while I eat and drink. You may eat and drink when I am finished. Is he grateful to that servant because he did what was commanded? So it should be with you. When you have done all you have been commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done 
what we were obliged to do. Verbum Domini. The grace of God has appeared, saving all. The salvific will of God that he desires all to, to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth is revealed in all his works. That the epiphany of grace, as in Isaiah, upon the people who walked in darkness a great light has shone this most perfectly shines forth in the life of Christ. St. John tells us that God is light. In him, there is no darkness. And this light, which shines forth from all of creation, all of uh, his works, is a source of life. We've fallen into a great forgetfulness of the word of God, both scripturally and in that gift, which is grace in, in the gift of the present moment, in this word of God, which is a light unto our path. St. Paul constantly reminds the teachers of the church that sound doctrine impels a person who is saved and yet must work out salvation and fear and trembling to a life of virtue. Perhaps it's better to call this a graceful life because it's not simply by our own power. We cannot be saved uh, by our own power alone. By grace we are saved. But grace calls us to a graceful life. Sin and sound doctrine are like rancid oil to pure water that cannot mix. The oil of sin must be siphoned off if sound doctrine is to remain. So our Lord says, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. And it's not just blessed heart as in love, the, pure, the purity which should encompass all of us. All, so he says to love with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So uh, purity of doctrine is involved in this total cleanness that without which we will not see God. That this purity is a total cleanness re training us to reject godless ways and worldly desires as we await the blessed hope. So if we are to rejoice at the appearance of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we must receive the grace to purify our minds, to put on the mind of Christ, who humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death, death on a cross. That sin itself is a sign and source of clouded intellect. So I, a good example to place here is that the grace, the gift of God, which is the gift of life. And those who uh, promote the culture of life, that this leads us to a clarity of mind which allows us to see God in his other appearances which are so humble. So it, I, I don't fear to say that it's impossible to promote the culture of death and at the same time have true and pure belief in the reality of our Lord's body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Most Holy Eucharist. It seems very clear <laughs> that uh, we cannot see the humility of the grace of God in the unprotected, in, in the most vulnerable, and in his vulnerable state in the Holy Eucharist. So, so as in Proverbs 15, 26, the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. 
the words of the pure are pleasing to him. So our Lord talks about that purity of heart that is so necessary that that conversion of heart, which again is shown forth in our words and out of the fullness of heart, the mouth speaks. So when our Lord speaks in his parables, especially those of the kingdom, there's a present moment and an eschatological value. So when he comes again, so of course, uh, to, to the, peer, the, the grace of God has appeared. <laughs> so this is the present moment as we await. So our Lord uh, is, is making his epiphany, his appearance known already in the most holy Eucharist, but waiting for that final day. So as in Romans, for the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Today and every day of our lives, we are that servant who comes in from plowing or tending sheep in the field. And Jesus is t teaching us about the rewards of obedience, that what we should expect for a, a job well done. In truth, his lesson here, as in the recommendation to take the lowest place at table so that the host will exalt us in the sight of others, is common sense. The servant will be asked to serve and rarely receives the gratitude that is deserved in this life. So the lesson is directed towards our own self-value, how we judge ourselves, that we should be humble. So often we do a little work and we want lots of praise and then we rest on our laurels. So, but I did that nice little thing, you know, and then we get upset when people don't Give us great gratitude. So we think about our Lord, who is the most perfect and beautiful and wonderful and humble of men, that God, that God himself appearing to us in true flesh, uh, in the, the lack of gratitude that he received. The 10 lepers, which we'll have again soon, and only one returns to give thanks. And this is not one of the chosen people. So St. Francis, in another way, comes at the same problem and says in his admonitions, blessed is that servant who is not more puffed up because of the good the Lord says or works through him than because of what he says and works through another that a man sins who wishes to receive more from his neighbor than he is willing to give of himself to the Lord God. We are often looking for conversion in others. And even though we come to confession <laughs> and we continue to, you know, that we, you know, to, to recognize that we struggle so much to change ourselves and we want more from our neighbor that they should change then we're, we're willing to give to the Lord God. So again, this is, this is an, an why we need prayer so much, to ask for the graces we need. One day we'll come to another table, the heavenly one prepared for the beloved. And we will receive judgment according to what we have done and in a certain sense, according to the way we have thought in this life because what we do flows from how we think about things. In the fulfillment of our plowing and tending in this life. So that we receive the knowledge in the light of God, that we have been unprofitable servants, that we recognize how many graces in this life we have not used well, and how little gratitude we have given, or, or not received, but 
uh, we should be so grateful. And gratitude also is a great source of grace in our life. And, and when we say someone is graceful, uh, often they're very good at being grateful for even small things in life. The truth is that God is grateful, that he is not simply a taskmaster, <laughs> uh, just not willing to be grateful. He is the source of gracefulness. And he rewards all those little efforts at doing what we have been asked, always, uh, always supporting us by grace. So the reward, in, reward of obedience is life and light, that our minds are, are purified, that we take on the mind of Christ, and are then uh, in this purity of heart and mind, soul and strength, we can see God. And we will come ever more deeply to be with him. So in heaven, our obedience will be rewarded, although even now it's not just in heaven. Obedience is rewarded with the gift of transformation in God. So as in 1 John 3, 2, we know that Christ, when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So we need not fear obedience, fear death, so long as we love the crucified one, that we know him and remain faithful to that love, to that knowledge of God.